Prashant Vaze works for the WWF in Hong Kong as their head of energy and climate issues. He has written three books, having recently published The Rising Tide, a young adult novel set in the near future. Welcome, Prashant. Welcome, Simon. Thanks for having me here. You're, you're most welcome to be here. How far in the future is The Rising Tide set? Well, the book is set around 50 years in the future, which I thought was quite a comfortable length of time because basically all the, the main characters um, in the book are actually either people who have already been born now or you can conceive of them being your children or grandchildren. So it was just far enough into the future that we've got that kind of link to now. And give me a sort of an outline of, of the, the, the story and how it relates to your vision of the, of the near future. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting book because in a way it's, um, it allows me to think about how I think the future might develop over the next few de decades. So it's got issues like um, how artificial intelligences, robots, the nature of work, the nature of schooling uh, might, might evolve over the next few decades. And you know, I've worked as a, essentially a policy wonk in uh, the governments for, in the UK and Hong Kong for quite some time. But over this is in, uh, overlaid the, the biggest kind of challenge, which is of climate change. And at the moment, we're kind of experiencing it in dribs and drabs. But 50 years in the future is when, you know, some of the kind of bigger effects will become manifest. And that's the kind of the overlay for the book. Right. So it starts with uh, our main character, which is Arya Lovelace, um, who's a sort of a precocious and highly intelligent 15-year-old. Uh, that's right. So, yeah. I mean, Arya is very much... I mean, the book is really... Uh, about the family, the Lovelace family, and it uh, sort of delves into three generations of Lovelaces. The, um, the heroine is very much Aria, and she's kind of described as a precocious, gifted. Um, she's got a slightly naughty side as well. So there's gets into trouble for hacking into the computer systems at the school and things like this. So heart of gold, but uh, not necessarily sticking by the rules. Mm. And and we um, can you outline the plot a little bit? I mean, what um, what sort of sets the story in motion? Well, I mean, the, the, the action is essentially centred in in one location. So it's nearly all based in um, sort of the Norwich, Norfolk area in, in the UK. And it's it's very tightly defined over just a few, two or three months of time. Um, and like I said, 50 years in the future. And what the action revolves around is really um, the first big kind of climate change events. So um, the backdrop of the book is... Um, the ice shelf in Greenland, it's slowly starting to, to, to disintegrate. And um, through the course of the book, we have a number of big chunks of ice breaking off Greenland and triggering tsunamis. And the, the main action in the book is really around one huge tsunami event, which um, strikes the whole of the kind of North Sea area. And um, the, well, I mean, after the event, um, villages are deluged and um, it's really the, the aftermath of then when uh, Arya is trying to reconnect with her family and discover things not just about um, the village, but about herself and her past and her family. Right. And in this area, there, um, one of the key features is that it has a huge refugee uh, population from the Netherlands. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what's going to happen with uh, a lot of the climate change impacts is it's going to be very unevenly felt around the world. So... Um, what will happen in Europe is that um, areas that are most low-lying, low I think, will be the first affected. And obviously, as we know, most of the Netherlands um, is, is below sea level. And uh, as soon as um, there's any kind of puncturing in the wall, um, it will be possibly inundated. So that's the kind of the scenario. But it's not going to be just Netherlands. I mean, there are many, many areas around the world that are like this. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, in my current job, I get to see a lot of the kind of forecasts and projections of where... Um, people think you know the, the the big devastating effects are going to be yeah so um tell me a little bit more about uh your main character and her family so aria's um well i don't want to pull the plot too much but uh, so she is a, um, a, a sort of an intelligent um 15 year old she has a brother tyler also quite precocious there's a big age gap between them and part of the kind of um um, plot it revolves around the, the relationship between the brother and sister, and, and they're how, relatively wealthy as a as a family. They, right? they're, they're well, they're very wealthy actually, because um, I mean her grandparents, um, the Lovelace seniors, um, were were very much behind the kind of um, the biofuel revolution. So in this book, it's, it's it's actually quite a benign picture of the future in the in the most part. So um, we've 
managed to kind of wean herself off fossil fuels over the course of the 50 years before the book uh, commenced. And the Lovelace family were very much at the kind of the centre of that. Um, they were biologists, they were um, you know, into robotics and stuff, and they, they kind of led the, the, the new industrial revolution, the sort of the biotech uh, revolution to sort of wean ourselves off fossil fuels. Um, so she's a very privileged kind of position. Her mother has tried to shelter her from this. Um, we, we don't really know what took place with her. Her grandparents' uh, relationship with Aria and her immediate family is kind of off camera a little bit. Um, her parents have essentially broken contact. And so what we have is a, a fairly domineering mother who's very much the same genetic stock as a, um, Susie Lovelace, the, the, the matriarch grandmother, um, a slightly dreamy father uh, who's a musician mm. and uh, very artistic, mm. and Tyler, who's um, the, the brother of uh, Aria. So that's the kind of the family unit. In some ways, I mean, I've got an Indian heritage and it's, it's hard to write a novel without conceiving of all the family, the grandparents, mm. all this kind of thing. Yeah, and there's also the, uh, the computer, the, the console that sort of essentially functions as a, a kind of a nanny for the the family and uh has it well it's I, I almost want to say it has an artificial intelligence i mean it does but you also suggest that in the book that artificial intelligence is banned is that correct yeah so i mean um there's this sort of a back history to to where they are there so there's a there's a kind of a, essentially um, a truce now between artificial intelligence and human um one of the, the, the stories that uh, took place off camera was several decades previously. There was a terrible war between the AIs and humans, and uh, it was a very short war, but it was very conclusive. And then the AIs lost, and um, as a result, there's been a great simplification of a lot of the internet. So what, the, the internet's been replaced by something called the pipes, where um, no ex- executable code is allowed to be transferred. It's, it's simply data, mm. and uh, so the idea there is that. Um, humans have decided to rein in um, some of the kind of excesses of artificial intelligences and, and computing just allowed to run amok. So there's, there's kind of uh, strictures on how artificial intelligence are allowed to be used, hardly at all. Um, there's also restrictions on the degree of automation, so some jobs are set aside for human only, and only humans are allowed to do them. And um, so the idea is that there's a benign government that's looking out for the human interest and making sure that um, this kind of injection of capital into sort of the Amazon um, Uber type um, dominance over humans by machines that, that's 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 really sort of strictly curtailed mm. in the book. Sure, but having said that, the the computer is kind of slightly bad tempered and um, you know it doesn't. Uh, doesn't really allow um it, and kind of sarcastic at times i think as well right yes i mean the, the computer is um quite a central character in the book and uh, over the course of the novel you'll realize that things aren't exactly what they seem with the computer and um i think um you know quite early on arias and her brother tyler are very much instructed don't talk about how outside of the house and that's you know they're, they're kind of treading a thin line Computers are still useful to have, even if they're not allowed to be um, fully utilised up to their potential. Mm. So I think there is this kind of, there's always this kind of um, gut instinct to, to push the law, you know, even if things are no longer allowed you know, to hold back technology. So it's quite difficult for a family like the Lovelaces. The technology is kind of where they, you know, it's in their DNA, really. Mm. Sure. So the the setting, as you said, is is Norfolk. And the feeling that um, I get is that maybe the the sort of city as we know it has been kind of splintered and people are now living in smaller um, villages. They have to take a, a quite long bus ride to get um, from school to home. Um, how how have you conceived of the setting? Well, I actually spent a bit of time actually just sort of uh, driving around Norfolk and, and looking, at, looking at places. So uh, these, these are generally r- real settings. So I've changed the names a little bit just to... to mask identities but um it, the villages around uh, that part of uh, the Norfolk brought are fr- pretty much as they are described it's it's a i mean in, in this kind of scenario um because of the increased risk of flooding um there's been a, a um, essentially a, a lot of the population of, of Norfolk has has moved out um the, the village which is where this is set wetsam is is the exception really because um the lovelace family have developed a huge refinery 
uh, just alongside the coast there. So that's created jobs. But there has been a, in the kind of low-lying areas, it's, they, they're described as being insurance no-zones. So it's no longer possible to get um, home insurance there. Mm. So there's been a kind of a forced um, uh, evacuation of some of the low-lying areas. which is, It's done in a quite an orderly way, so it's not caused a huge amount of problems. But I mean, what, what's happened here is that a lot of the refugee colonies have been put there instead. So um, why why not make a fast buck mm. at, at the expense of the refugees is kind of one of the subtexts of yeah. what's going on there. Yeah. And then... Um, the the refugees um, the the I don't want to call it a camp it's, it's I mean there's it's a community right and it's called the tulips um, there are a lot of uh, references to this um, and how the children for example the um, they're not really quite integrating with the the local children um, what was the inspiration for that I mean it's, it's partly sort of writing this during the kind of the Brexit um, time where if you're trying to conceive of where UK might be in 50 years, and a lot of that's been driven by uh, sentiment about migration. Um, and I, So at the back of my mind, it's the way we view migrants is often conditioned by their relative standing to our country. So um, the experience of, a, of a, a US or German or Dutch refugee today in the UK is probably very different to that of somebody from Somalia or or, or, or um, Bangladesh or a country which is you know you know economically less less strong, and I wanted to just show that there's nothing kind of immutable about um, this kind of pecking order between countries. And if um, a distressed Netherlands, which is completely economically bankrupted by previous tsunamis and um, sea level rise events, I mean that kind of relative positioning of um, the Dutch compared to um, the Brits might be might be sort of um, revised really. So what the, what you, what's shown in the book is really that kind of that you know the, the children are very aware of this pecking order between countries, and um, they, they see the, the the Dutch kids there as you know they're doing them a favour by allowing them into the UK. And um, mm-hmm. in future books, there is going to be more of a tension here. Um, so um, there, there there is going to be sort of scapegoating of, of the refugee populations, not so much in this book, which is taking place in that moment of crisis, those two or three months of the first tsunami events, but. When the country tries to rebuild, that's when I think the tensions are going to uh, really sort of open up. And I think that's going to be a, a real situation in real life, that um, India and Bangladesh might see themselves as comparable countries, but that um, that equality might change in 30 or 40 years when Bangladesh is suddenly on the receiving end of uh, climate impacts and India is in a, in a stronger position. Mm. Um, I The fact that it's called the tulips, um, for me, calls to mind that tulip fever which is always um, cited um, in if you look at economics or if you study it it's always one of the um, very uh, significant and kind of quite strange yeah. um, economic events I wonder if that was a, a reference that you were making there I, I have to say it's a very I hadn't occurred to me before but you're quite right about the tulip fever um, I mean later on in the book there is a kind of a, um, a ribbon cutting event where the Prime Minister of Netherlands, uh, King of Netherlands, and the Prime Minister of the UK um, open up the, the the housing developments ten years ago when it, everything was pally pally, um, and tulips was very much at that time regarded as being you know symbolic of Netherlands really. Mm. But you're quite right. There is this kind of um, in economics, it's not a it's not a it's like the Dutch disease. I mean, the tulip fever and the Dutch disease are the you know, Netherlands are two uh, kind of contributions to economic mayhem really. Yeah. So you work in the field of um, energy and the climate, and how does your? I mean, you you've already um, explained some in some ways how um, climate change is, is such a major part of the book. But how how was how did your how does your work impact directly on the book? I mean, was it something that? It, I suppose my question is: Did your uh, did your work inspire you to write the book, or is the book inspired by your work? If, they are different questions. <laughs> um, I've certainly worked on climate change issues on and off in my career for the best part of 15, 20 years from many different directions, from consulting, from working as a civil servant in the UK developing policy on this, from the consumer movement where I was trying to sort of champion the consumer interest. And I think all the way throughout I've, I've always felt that um, it's very difficult to get people to emotionally engage with climate change. And it's partly to do with... Um, 
it needs a strong narrative, a strong kind of feeling of um, individual people are going to be impacted by this. I mean, the trouble with the, the, a lot of discourse about climate change is, it, you know, it talks about sea level rises or temperatures or it's, it's very kind of abstract terms. And worse than that, it's often far into the future. So, you know, um, and, you know, hence we've ended up with this kind of constant, is this particular heat wave to do with climate change or is it just background variability? And I mean, there's no honest answer to this. I mean, the whole nature of climate change is it, it affects the frequency of things, it affects the relative um, rate at which um, observed changes are surprise events take place. Mm. So the black swans stop, stop being black swans and become commonplace. So um, what I wanted to do was really try to explore uh, the issue of climate change in three volumes at three different time frames. So this one is a particular episode. It's a three-month chunk in which a big climate event, and it's an ambiguous climate event by then, nobody's sitting there disputing the science. The next one's meant to be a three-year event where, um, I mean, the thing with climate change is there are weather impacts and then there are longer term impacts. And in a way, I mean, the book is called The Rising Tide and the, the, the sea is, it, it kind of is, an, it's a place where climate changes accumulate. The, 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 the sea level rise is a function of all the, the temperature on average that's occurring around the world smoothed out over decades. And so when you see sea level rise, that's a pretty good barometer of you know what what global warming is taking place. So the, the next sort of one is really to do with the disintegration of um, well the great big stores of fresh water, um, the, the, the 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 glaciers on Greenland. So if those ever um, fully um, melt, I mean that they'll cause sea level rise to be about six meters, which would be you know curtains. So I wanted to sort of explore that. I mean, that's something that is actually forecast to happen under a two-degree world where we're heading to, but it's not going to happen for many, many centuries. What I've done is really fast-forward it in this book. Mm. And uh, the third volume was meant to be about um, climate change over the 300-year period where equilibrium sits in. So um, I wanted to try making that kind of um, almost impossible for human beings to fathom um, time frames. Um, sort of real. So in a way, I've, I've picked on a particular family in a particular city in this one. The next one's going to be set over a much longer period of time over continents. And then uh, the, the one after is really to do with civilization as a whole, really. Right. How, I mean, you, you mentioned that it is difficult for people to conceive of climate change um, and these big and long term issues. So, how did you manage to avoid being preachy? And your book is not preachy at all, it is very. I mean, it's enjoyable. It doesn't feel like you know a tirade against um, you know big business or fossil fuels or anything. How how did you manage to walk that line? Well, I very consciously tried not to make it about the fight between fossil fuels and renewables. Those, those fights are real and are taking place now. It was really about the aftermath of you know what it will be like to be at the receiving end of climate change. And I mean, through the book, there is actually. Um, a narrative of the grandparents um, as they're sort of growing their company and how they're um, trying to create a sort of a zero carbon um, economy through their work. So I do inject that real life tension in there, but the book is essentially not about that. It's about the aftermath. It's about once climate change has happened as a society, how do we, in this, this book's all about the disaster relief. The next one's going to be about the kind of um, escape from, climate change um, because the good thing about humanity is we learn quickly I mean you know once you know once we've got the kind of the wartime spirit into mm. us we you know we did amazing things during the, the second world war and the mm. first world war in terms of just re-engineering our economies to, to the war efforts and in a way that's what the uh, is going to be required I think one of the you know, like most science fiction is really about the present I think as somebody who works in climate change and energy issues I wish we'd have a wartime effort now to mitigate um, I don't sense it's about to happen anytime soon, but uh, you know I'm hoping that through this kind of fiction we can try to energize people a bit more. Mm. So education and immigration are themes. Well, I think that partly because I work in education, so I always notice anything about that. Yeah. Um, how did you develop these themes, and what other themes uh, have you introduced? Yeah, I mean it's a YA book, so obviously um, the characters are predominantly uh, young people. Um, so I wanted to just think a little bit about uh, how education might develop. 
um, in the future. And I mean, one of the projects I was involved with, I was working with the Prime Minister's office, was um, the future of education, you know, many, many uh, decades into the future. And I've myself, I ended up sort of reteaching myself um, on a couple of occasions through MOOCs and uh, some of these kind of massive online courses. Um, so, I mean, the book really talks about um, the nature of schooling changing, so education is much more personalised. So individual students get much more tailored, um, almost MOOC-style, simulation-based uh, teaching. And uh, the teachers are uh, teachers are in a very, um, they're very much the um, leaders of the education experience. So they're curating the courses, evaluating. Um, it's, it's, it's a feature in which there are fewer teachers, but they're held in much more respect and um, well-paid. There are sort of teaching assistants there who kind of dip in and out of the, um, the, the, the simulations, you know, almost as avatars. So it's, 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 it's an education that's based around um, learning on the job of, you know, uh, the, the opening scene takes place in a, in a simulated chemistry yeah. lesson where they're um, trying to escape from the sort of um, a, a problem. Um, they're having to sort of recreate a chemical reaction in order to generate oxygen so that they can survive. And uh, sort of think, thinking on their feet, but I find that you know often for myself, I, I learn best when I'm kind of emotionally engaged with a lesson. And having this kind of simulation based one, I thought would be quite an interesting way of doing stuff. Mm. It was interesting for me that the the teachers are there in the classroom, but they're they're also present within the simulation. So yeah, as you say, they're kind of dipping in and out, and they're, they're represented by their avatars as well. Um, and then the the but the the simulations are called the didactics, right? And um, yeah. I think that was quite a, an interesting. Can you explain why you you chose that? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, that, I'm not sure if it's Greek or Latin, but the word you know, the didactic is a uh, is a uh, you know to impart knowledge. So uh, I wanted to make that. I mean, it sounded better than just calling calling the software a MOOC or something but it, or it, a simulation. It, it does have that. It, has a slightly negative implication as well, right? That you know, as if you're being, if someone is speaking didactically, then it's being down to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. I must say, I, I thought of it in a more kind of constructive way. It was, it was an environment in which you learn, and um, it wasn't meant to be a sort of preachy. You will learn this, but I, I see your point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and how about some of the um, other themes that you are, are exploring in the book? I mean, uh, there's quite a lot about um, the nature of work, and um, it's it's going to be a challenge, I think, having full employment in the future going forward. Um, obviously, as um, I mean, the nature of a, a lot of economic growth is um, you invest capital in order to replace labour, and um, certainly I, one of my previous um, uh, projects, my, my old job, was to looking at how Uber and um, some of the kind of food delivery companies are taking off. A lot of the app-based ones, um, and really these are about um, largely using software, machine learning techniques like this to displace humans. So in the book, um, I've talked about this kind of um, new equilibrium that sets in, where the government sort of steps in and says certain jobs, you know, they have to be done by humans, and especially the human-facing ones. I mean, nobody particularly wants um, a school bus to be um, entirely populated by just machines. The idea of having somebody there to supervise, you know, rowdy kids, you know, even though it's not strictly necessary once you've got um, self-drive vehicles. So I've, 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 I've sort of thought about professions where uh, a benevolent government might want to forcibly insert humans. So same with farming. Farming is something that people enjoy. Um, it's, it's got a high quality of life. So um, that's another sort of um, what I call um, a profession that's basically been... Um, you know, constrained that only humans can be employed in this. Mm. So um, that, that was sort of talking a bit about the nature of work. Um, and in fact, one of the later scenes takes place in a, essentially a graveyard of robots, which were robots which were deemed illegal. They were displacing humans. And uh, our, our heroine, Aria, sort of cobbles together her own robot and behind within her own kind of um, house, she kind of gets them going, mm. uh, which is, you know, her mother throws a fit saying, what you're doing is strictly against the law, how dare you sort of thing. But yeah. uh, there's always going to be that tussle between people wanting to use their brains to um, get rid of jobs. And you feel like even in Hong Kong, you look around and think, are all these jobs necessary? Well, yes, if they're helping social stability, what's wrong with that? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you to read a little bit of 
your book. Uh, what can you introduce the, the context for the, the reading that you're going to do? Sure, I've been delighted to. I'm going to read a small section which is set quite early in the book, and it's one in which um, one of the characters, Blake, is um, engaged in a race across the North Pole. So this is the North Pole that's now melted, and uh, he's a kite surfer. And it's quite an exciting scene where, you know, he's, um, he was a schoolmate of Arias just a year or two back, and suddenly he's made it big by uh, getting sponsorship of a sports uh, video company, and he's uh, about to, you know, hopefully do well in this race. Mm. All right. We watch the race, almost too nervous to draw breath as Miss Martin enters. The weather in the Arctic Circle is ten times worse than it is here. Instead of British-style rain, sleet craters the slate-grey sea. I use the swarm of drones circling Blake to source my data feed. Their cameras provide a total immersion into Blake's world. I flick to the vid station commentary every few minutes. The sponsorship deal allows Blake to fund five drones, all fitted with microphones. They operate semi-autonomously, making their own decisions how to position themselves to get the best angles. One is trained on Blake's face, one high above to give a bird's eye view of the immediate waters, and several encircle him. One of the camera feeds suddenly dies as the battery goes flat. For some reason it wasn't able to recharge at the crib. Blake lets out a yelp of joy as he crosses the magnetic North Pole. It's taken him just under seven hours. He curls his toes through the straps to make sure he has a good grip on his board and winks at his viewers. This is for my girls back home. He's about to do a spin, says B. Beatrix Constanza, if I hear another squeak out of you, you'll be sent home. Bronte and I exchange a knowing look. He must mean us. I have to admit the outside possibility he might mean Parvati, his new girlfriend. Unlike every other girl at school, I have avoided developing a crush on Blake. Much to their annoyance, I also have bragging rights because I attended his going away party. He waves at one of the cameras, pulls the kite up and launches into an airborne 360 degree flip. He hovers in the air for a full 10 seconds. The perpetual arctic summer sun is behind him and renders his tall, slim body into a beautiful athletic silhouette, looking like the ancient Greek hero Icarus. The news networks will show this image of Blake over and over again the next few days. As he crosses the North Pole, all the news feeds erupt, labelling him England's bravest young athlete, the country's most gifted and charismatic extreme sports star. My integrity is suddenly pounded with data as my friends simultaneously input their comments. My wall even picks up a comment from Dad who rarely uses social media. I feel so achingly proud to know Blake. He does a couple more circumnavigations of the globe for good measure and then a final exhausting 10 second flight into the sky. Viewers are bombarding him with questions. Even there at the North Pole no one is properly alone. He answers them patiently. I wonder if he gets tired of all this attention. The sea temperature is just five degrees now. His voice is getting hoarse from the salt spray and from maintaining this constant commentary. The summer sun doesn't set for another month. Once the sun goes down, the sea will freeze over. Even though it's been summer for four months, it's still really cold. Without my four season wetsuit, I'd be dead in minutes. I wouldn't want to fall in the water. Swim? Beats me. Why would anyone want to try swimming? He taps his earphones. I'm going to switch off my earpiece as I'm about to start the trip back home. It should be easy. Just head south. Blake croaks with laughter in his voice. Of course, the entire world is south. He orders one of the hovering cameras to climb high to find the marker to give him the direction back to Greenland. His compass is useless this close to the magnetic North Pole, and he has to rely on GPS. He tugs his huge sail, swinging it around so it pulls him back homewards. It's exhausting being battered by the snow like this but at least the wind has quietened down. I can see almost, oh, at least 10 meters. His voice is jokey, but I can hear his apprehension. I wonder how long conditions are going to stay like this. I need to keep my energy up as I'll be sailing against the wind on the way back. An interviewer cuts to his incredibly beautiful girlfriend, Poverty, who's sitting in a barge moored a hundred miles north of Greenland on the finishing line. Halfway there, she says excitedly. She works as a news presenter herself, so is at home in front of the camera. I'm so nervous for him. I can see how exhausted he is. The weather has been atrocious. The main news feed cuts back to Blake. Something dramatic must be taking place. 
I watch anxiously as a gust of wind unexpectedly catches Blake's sail. He's lifted 50 feet into the air and then plunges back down. His board crunches not into water, but onto a block of sea ice. For a moment it looks as though the board will come away from his feet and slide into the water. But somehow he manages to keep his balance and falls into a clumsy crouch. Not elegant, but he manages to stay upright on the board and not into the icy waters. So you've written books before, but they have been non-fiction books. Um, how was your experience different in writing um, a novel? Yes, I mean, uh, I've written two um, popular environmental economics uh, policy books, um, which in both cases I kind of approached a publisher and um, got a sort of a, essentially a green light at the early stage of the project. So I, I was pretty confident it would get published. Mm. Um and it's interesting because the two books were written just a few years apart with the same publisher, and uh, I was very conscious of the nature of publishing is changing even over those short few years. Where um, in the first book, um, written almost ten years ago now, um, I just got the impression that um, e-books, Amazon hadn't yet taken off, and publishing there were still independent publishers mm-hmm. and um, not the degree of consolidation that has occurred since then. Uh, the next book was written about three years later, and by then, that small independent publisher had been subsumed by one of the big companies. Um, I think big losses of jobs and you know what used to be a kind of a, a marketing department has shrunk down to one marketing individual doing that in print. And um, so I noticed a, a, quite a big change in, in those just in those three years. Um, this book, I kind of, I did send it to a number of agents. Um, so I finished it back in July uh, this year. And um, I sort of sent it maybe to fifteen twenty, and uh, I, you know, I, I was only kind of half-hearted a little bit. So uh, the the responses were typically interesting idea. We we like it, but uh, not sufficiently to want to um, invest months and months of time in doing it up. Mm. So um, I kind of had always in the back of my mind thought I was going to probably go for the. Self-publishing route, mm. and uh, you know, one of our friends here in Hong Kong that we we both know has had a, quite a degree of success with this, and um, so yeah, I thought let's try that instead, and um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's it's very much where you know, you're responsible for doing, um, organizing the cover, organizing the the proofreading, organizing all this kind of thing, and then the hard bit, which is the marketing, which I'm sure that you know you read about it on the internet saying you need to spend half your time on marketing. It's true, you have to. <laughs> it's the thing that's kind of a bit alien, I think, if you've been writing. Mm. But it, it's been very enjoyable. Um, but I, you know, I think the industry is is going through a huge rev- revolution now. And a friend of mine who's written the book pretty much the same time as me, he's written on his second book now, second novel, similar kind of theme. And we we have compared notes a little bit, and he's saying that he's having to do just as much marketing despite being under the kind of the banner of a um, you know, one of these very well known publishers and stuff. Yeah, I think that's very much the story that a lot of people have, even if they have had their book picked up. You're still, at the end of the day, you're, you know, slogging out with a suitcase of books to speak somewhere and, and trying to sell a few here and a few there. And it's, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of writing work is really got nothing to do with writing at all. Is yeah. is all of the other stuff? Yeah. So how how about um your your writing process? I mean, did you write everything? Um, all in one go and then go back to redraft or did you sort of develop it as you went along? So I, I plotted the book out fairly carefully quite early on. Uh, I had big sort of A2 sheets of paper where I was lines linking this character with that character, I potted biographies. Um, so I did quite a lot of planning beforehand. Um, I write quite quickly. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I've worked full time for this book. Um, so I've really stolen lunch times, stolen mornings, stolen a few hours at weekends in between doing everything else you need to do at weekend. Mm. Um, it took a year or two to write, but it was, um, you know, I, I can generally produce a few hundred words an hour, so I, I know the speed at which I write, and I, I just make sure that I've got pockets of time enough for that. Mm. And then what about the redrafting process? So um, it probably went through about three drafts altogether. So the, the the second draft was a pretty substantial rewrite. Um, the third draft was just tidying up and making sure that there's consistencies. I mean, you know, word is a wonderful package and sense of 
if you decide you want to change the names of something or search and replace some idea, it's pretty quick at doing that mm. kind of thing. And um, you know, I had a few people, including from the Hong Kong Writers Club, who um, helped sort of proofread the early chapters, and that was very welcome and very useful. And uh, at least one or two of those ideas kind of made the, their way through to elsewhere in the book as well. Mm. And how about uh, the cover? It's a beautiful illustration. Who did you get to do that? Yeah, so I was lucky enough to get a, uh, an artist uh, by the name of uh, Janice Duke, who was uh, sort of recommended through LinkedIn, really. So I, I, I chanced upon her through people who published books. Uh, we exchanged a few emails, and she sort of shared a few of the previous covers with me. So she's been in the business for quite some time. She's written a, done a lot of uh, fantasy, science fiction book covers. Um, it, was, it was very nice, very easy process. Uh, very much enjoyed it. Um, it took about two or three iterations. Um, and then the other sort of essentially bought in service that I got was uh, on the proof, uh, proofreading. So it was um, a couple of um, teachers, actually, English teachers, who were based out of Crete, um, uh, Tanya uh, and uh, Tim Edwards. And uh, they, they, they kind of went through it in some detail. And Tim, in particular, was a bit of a science fiction fan and um, was very, very useful. And both of them were very useful in mm. terms of uh, picking out. Um, errors and uh, improving my schoolboy English a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> That's good. And then after that, I guess you would have had it typeset and then sent to the printers. How how did that work out for you? Well, well actually, with, with um, Kindle nowadays, you can just upload a Word file. So um, I mean, what you effectively do is you just take the Word file, it does a PDF of it, and um, it, it's very specific about the kind of dimensions and the fonts and this kind of thing. And as long as you get the page size right, the PDF will come out correct. Mm. And um, I mean, again, the Amazon software is very helpful. It, it tells you exactly what it wants. Um, with the uh, the Kindle version of the book, it doesn't really very much matter because, in a way, the reader selects the font and the size and stuff. Because it's a printed copy as well, um, Amazon have a kind of a, a print on demand service. And for that, it has to be very, very specifically defined in a particular way to make sure it fits on the printed page and things. My understanding is that they have a number of different uh, printers that they work in tandem with. So this one, these, the, the copies that I've got here were printed in the UK and I had to import them in it. Uh, no, no discount at all for authors, unfortunately. I had, to, mm. I had to pay the full cost and put a person packing. So, uh, mm. um, obviously, the, the world of uh, your novel, The Rising Tide, is very important. Um, what advice could you give to the other writers out there about world building, especially in a, a sci-fi novel? I mean, it's really fun to do the world building, actually. So, um, I mean, for me, um, I spent a fair bit of time just reading about how the future might be. So it's, it's reading newspapers, reading The Economist, reading New Scientist, all these kind of things. Um, I, 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 I like science fiction anyway. So um, for me, it's, it's really sort of drawing a coherent um, possible future. So I wanted to sort of build a world with politics in there, with economics in there, with demography in there. Uh, with possible international relations in there. So I did almost sort of do a pestle analysis of the politics, economics, science, technologies, all those different aspects of it. Um, and, uh, you know, you end up throwing away quite a lot of your things, but in, in um, but th- there is a kind of a, a background document which does talk quite a lot about um, the world in which it you know, this, these characters are living in. Um, I don't think humanity changes very much, but I, I think... The way we interact with these other changes is a hell of a lot. If um, you know, it's sort of contingent on the political relationships between countries and stuff, so I think it's quite important to spend a bit of time just thinking that through. I mean, what I don't like reading is books that haven't really spent enough time on this, and they just come out with some little aspect of the future that's just changed without it all being the co- coherent whole. I mean, there's I, I can remember reading one uh, YA science fiction book where you know they got rid of money and. Um, that was it. You know, that was their kind of vision of the future, but much else was exactly the same. Mm. And uh, you know, you, you've got to think about how lots of things are going to change at the same time, and uh, that's that's quite important, I think. Yeah, it's got to have the the ring of truth about it. Um, what I said to you before we started recording this interview, and I haven't really thought of a better way of saying it, um, is that it, it was not annoying. And I get annoyed when I read science fiction books that come out with a lot of new vocabulary that you've got to try and figure out what it is. Um, or, and there's lots of, it suggests a lot of things without you actually um, being part of it or people talk about things that you're not part of and, you, and it, it's a very alienating uh, 
um, feeling, uh, which you don't do at all, which is really nice. It's quite, you're led into it quite gently. Um, but at the same time, I think you've, you've managed to tie in um, the plot to uh, very tightly into what is happening. So, for example, you introduce in the very first chapter um, the idea of the virtual reality lessons, but that the result of that is something that leads to her being uh, suggested to attend this very prestigious school, and and the plot gets moving from there. So, there's not this sense of um, an information dump either. I think I think you managed to 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 manage that very um, very effectively. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I must say I was under a bit of pressure there from my two beta readers, my wife and my daughter, who um, neither of whom like science fiction very much, and both of whom are very turned off by terminology for the sake of terminology or different things just for the sake of different things. So uh, why will um, people call their handheld computers something completely alien? Why not just call them a glove if that's all they are? Um, so, yeah, so I, I tried to make it so you wouldn't have to create a glossary at the back to translate um, all these new words into to things that people can understand. Mm. I mean, some people, some people like that, I think. And I think, especially I would say, when you see a sci-fi novel series and there'll be sort of 10 books and they're all sort of 800 pages, I think people quite like that. But I think it's quite niche. And I suspect that you were not trying to write something that was too niche, you know, I think it was supposed to be accessible. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it had a sort of, it's, it's an environmental book which is set in the near future, so I wanted the readership to include people who wouldn't always necessarily find science fiction that interesting for themselves. Mm. So you mentioned that you've got uh, part two and part three uh, that you're developing, um, what are you writing right now? So at the moment um, I'm, I'm doing the sort of the plotting of part two, which is um, the sequel to this, and it's kind of set really from um, almost immediately after this book, but it's it, the duration of it's much longer. And uh, it's really uh, allowing the effects of climate change not to be manifest, not just on from one episode, but through how it affects many different countries at the same time. It's, and it's quite a, quite a challenge. I mean, I, I, I'm spending a lot of time now reading, so I think, you know, as a way to sort of recharge the batteries, it's important to just to to pick up um, other novels. So I'm, I'm sort of devouring novels at the moment, you mm. know, one or two a week. Um, and also reading some uh, fi- uh, factual books about climate change. Um, I mean, I, luckily in my job, I get to, to, to do this in work time as well. Mm. So uh, it's often a little bit indistinguishable what I'm doing is research or whether it's just part of my day job. Yeah, sure. So um, that's actually quite, quite, I'm quite fortunate that way. Um, I mean, I'm reading some horrible stuff about, um, you know, the Asia Development Bank, the ADB, some of its um, ideas about how climate change is going to affect Asia. So obviously that's where we're living now. And um, uh, the kind of futures of countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Hong Kong to an extent, in a world in which there's um, uh, just a few metres sea level rise is really quite bleak. And um, already uh, Jakarta and uh, Mushu Java is actually underwater, technically speaking. Mm. It's only the sea walls that are keeping, keeping the sea out. And um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to just work out what the scenario is. I've been trying to sort of talk to a bit of a few of the people here in the Hong Kong Observatory about um, resilience and how we design things differently. Because this book is not a dystopic. It's a book about how the future is likely to be and how, as an adult civilization, we're going to you know, man up and deal with it. Mm. It's not a book about despair and um, Mad Max taking place. Yeah. It's a book about how, as grown-ups, we, 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 we deal with what's ahead of us, really. Mm. So where can interested people buy a copy of The Rising Tide? Well, I mean, it's, it's available um, both as a, um, a Kindle version of the Amazon websites. So you can get it from wherever you have your Amazon account. Just uh, buy it there. And uh, it's also available in print copy, again, off Amazon. So uh, I've only really put it through Amazon. Um, I have a few copies myself, <laughs> if anyone's interested. But um, it's... Um, in Hong Kong, it's not actually available over the bookshop in the bookshops, but it, it takes about two or three weeks to order. I think. Okay. If, uh, if you, you kind of buy it online. Sure. All right. Well, Prashant Fazay, thank you very much for coming in to talk about your book today. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>